And we're back. Welcome to the Agostino Zynga Show. Hope you guys are well. This is me, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is the Agostino Zynga Show. I just nearly forgot my name there, but you know, we're just going to carry on and just steamroll our way through it. This is episode number 248. That's Dos Cuatro Ocho. How you doing? Como estas, my amigos, mi chicas, mi chicos, mi hombres. Whatever you are, hope you are, hope you're hydrated. Are you good? Good, good, good. How am I? I'm feeling pretty fine. Feeling pretty good. Today, this or this morning's a rest day in terms of gym. I'm gonna go running to later on today. I'm gonna do hopefully gonna do three miles. The plan was to do the plan to the plan this week was to do five miles a day, Monday to Friday. But I don't think I'll be able to handle it like in terms of you know endurance wise. So I think I'm gonna start off small. And do five miles on a Monday, which I did yesterday, and then do five miles on a Friday. Because usually, as I said before, I like to do two workouts on a Monday and Friday to kind of like um, start my week off strong and to end it strong. But then I think from today onwards, from Tuesday to Thursday, I'm going to do three miles each after work. So that'll probably be the way that I'll kind of schedule my things, just to kind of keep myself fresh for when I have the five mile run on a Friday. Again, these are not full blast runs. I'm not fucking because before I used to run really fast training wise because I don't know just because I thought I was in a race, which I'm not. It's good to run. I think I've learned that from the um, um, Kipchoge interviews since he kind of broke the marathon record. Um, that I think he says a lot in his interviews prior that he tries to train. He doesn't train like he races. Like he trains, I think, to 80% max capacity, sometimes 70, 60. So that when it comes to race, that you have something in your tank left over. Um, I think that's quite good. Again, I think psychologically too is quite good too when you know you're running at 80% of your pace but then you see somebody else absolutely killing themselves. So, you know, you've got an extra little 20% left in the tank when, if need be. Um, and again, you know, usually in my experience, usually race days, you tend to run quicker than you've ever done in training anyway. So there's no need to go full blast, hell or skelter, um, you know, pushing it to the edge in training when you know you're going to turn up into a race and you're going to, you know, you're going to possibly, due to the kind of, you know, excitement and the endorphins running through your body and everyone just around you doing their best too, it's going to raise your game. So there's no point of going extra balls to the wall during your training session, I would assume. So that's what I'm going to do now and that's what I've been doing currently. And I'm feeling pretty good. I'm feeling pretty strong. I've swapped out my shoes at the moment. Um, I've got these. I've got to buy some new... Um, I've got to buy... Um, what are they called? Um, um, not Hoka. It's pronounced Hoki. How's it, how's it pronounced? Oki, right? Is it Oki? Okiana or something? Like that. Uh, anyway, how is it pronounced? I've got to get a new pair of... Um, I've got to get a pair of Hoka 1 ones, which I don't have a pair of actually. Um, I've been wearing my new balances at the moment, which I kind of, you know, um, seen better days. So I've got to get rid of those. So I've kind of swapped them out and started wearing these sketches that I've had for a while. I'm not sure what they're called, what model it is. Probably doesn't matter what model it is, but I think I picked those up from, I don't know. I'm going to say I got these from Sports Direct or something. Like they're, they're just the cheapest shoe that was available at the time. So I, I, I was wearing them for a while, then I stopped because the insole is made out of this weird sort of like velvety sort of material. So that when I was running, um, my heel would slip out the back no matter how no matter how much I tied it in the forefoot, my heel kept on slipping out, which kind of made me think, you know, of how impressive some of the newer sneakers are where they normally have a little bit more of a, your, the heel sort of like pops out a bit more. So your heel proper sinks into the back of the, the back of the heel cup. So what I had to do in order to make it fit so it didn't slip off my shoe is I had to kind of cut the velvet stuff out of the back heel here, as you can see. I've kind of taken the velvet stuff out of there, right? So that when I put my foot in, my foot kind of scrapes along the back of it. But obviously the other problem about it is that now I have a whole full, I have a whole hill full of hill. I have a whole hill full of foam since I've been using that. But it's the only way I got it to work. So that's what I'm going to do at the moment. Um, so I've been wearing these sketches so far for my long runs because they're a bit softer. They've got a bit more of a, you know, thicker, thicker sole on them. So that kind of helps with the running. Usually I try and run on my fourth foot anyway, as you can see with the tread. I like seeing my my patterns of my running. You can see here that most of my tread at the front is what's kind of been worn out. So that's quite a good sign to see that, you know, I'm actually running the right way on the balls of my feet. But yeah, I need to get a new pair of Hoka 1-1s. Um, I've seen quite a few options actually out available at the moment. They go for quite a lot as well, second-hand ones on eBay. So I think they're, they're pretty um, well-regarded brand amongst the endurance or amongst the you know, um, marathon runners or 5K runners out there at the moment, probably because it's got a fixed sole. So people that have, you know, um, plans of fascia, I probably tend to use them quite often. But I like just the look of them in general. I probably should go for more of a minimalist shoe. But what I tried to do, I think I did that last time when I had my undercover Nikes, is that I tried to have a minimalist shoe 
something with like a zero drop for a race day. I think it's quite cool to kind of come into a race day wearing, you know, the finish shoe you can possible in order to kind of make sure you kind of get a good a good run time and just to kind of get you back into good habits. And then during my training, because training is like a continuous thing you're doing week in, week out, I try to wear a, sole, a shoe that has more of a thicker sole just for the cushioning and just to kind of make sure your feet don't get fucked up. And it kind of allows you some room for error. You can fuck around and maybe like once you're getting tired, start to heel strike a little bit, start to run a bit flat footed. But you can't necessarily do that with a zero drop shoe, right? You feel every single pebble and every single nook or cranny of the road. But that's my current running or race equipment schedule at the moment. I've got quite good race equipment at the moment. I think I've, there was a period of time where I used to just wear shitty things. Now I've kind of bought, you know, some tights. I bought some compression tops. Um, I've got some compression socks. I've got some compression um, five things. I've got some arm compression armbands. I've got headbands. I've got running tops. I've got loads of stuff. Actual equipment. The only thing I'm missing now is the shoes, which I tend to do quite often. You know, I'm sure other people are like that where you tend to. There was a period of time where I had loads of jackets and not enough clothes, right? So I had loads of jackets but not enough shirts, not enough t-shirts, long sleeves, jeans, whatever. And then now I've got way too many jeans, not enough jackets. You know I mean, it's, you, you end up in this weird predicament, which is probably why people tend to usually buy um, outfits and then try and buy things that work within the same outfit. So if you're going to buy like a trench coat, a turtleneck and a pair of trousers, you then maybe buy a couple of other tops that also go well with a long trench coat, a couple of other trousers that go well with that kind of jumper. So you have things to interlock with it because then when you start buying just outfits, you tend to not have a lot in your wardrobe because you tend to just kind of exhaust that one option, move on to the next, exhaust that, move on to the next, exhaust that until you get to a point where, you know, it gets a bit crazy. But, you know, what can you do? We get there bit by bit. Um, That's about it for me training wise. Whilst I have planned this week, not much really. Um, Maybe DJing on the Friday or the Saturday. So that should be something I'm looking forward to do as per usual. Um, I've mentioned before, I've, I've been in a bit of a tear when it comes to picking up songs and tunes to play on the old clone and stuff so that's been pretty awesome um it's good to kind of get back to record digging as well um again it's not the same as going to a shop it's going to phonica and browsing you know the shelves but there's no point in me going to phonica you know i'm not going to buy anything in there um, i'm not going to play anything in there if i want to play stuff from phonica i'd want to play vinyl but you know most bars and clubs that i play at don't have um, decent vinyl setup so that makes no sense whatsoever so by and large maybe is the best option to kind of do what i'm doing now at the moment um what else i want to talk to you about so um now you know what let's just get into it because i've got not got much time today so you need to get straight into the topics and get on it on it like sonic as always if you're listening via the podcast app leave me a five star review at the end of this that would be awesome to people can find the show if you're watching via youtube of course give me a like give me a thumbs up maybe leave me a comment and if you like what i hear what like, if you like what you see like what you hear then subscribe in it come back and check for man again okay let's get into, into the topics right so number one topic to get into a little bit of an update on the story that i reported upon yesterday um which concerned um the one drake getting booed at camp flogner um it seems as if tyler Crane has responded drake has responded i mean directly through academics so we're kind of going to go and talk about that and see what's kind of transpired since i made my comment the other day so it seems like my comments that i said previously kind of hold weight i think if you're looking at what tyler Crater says it seems as if the things i mentioned about you know maybe the fact that they they were they didn't announce drake beforehand so the fans were expecting it was a maybe a mistake the fact that drake appeared to come on stage when the fans assumed that frank ocean was going to appear was a mistake the fact that drake stopped in between to gaze the reception of the crowd was a mistake too maybe he kind of invited him he, he invited he gave people the opportunity to boo and to jump on a bandwagon and to you know make themselves um viral in that in that respect and the fact that in general you know tyler Crates fans are quite musically spoiled because they're used to a certain type of thing when they go to a camp vlog now. So to, to see someone like Drake on that stage, especially when it's not announced prior, was probably something that kind of jarred them and didn't really sit well with them at this present state of time. And I think also the fact that Frank Ocean has been a bit active the last few months, right? He's done, he's done, he's obviously rolling out an album or a project of some sort. He's doing that club night with AIDS awareness um, happening in New York at the moment. He's spoken about his love for the Bergheim. He's been a bit more press He's been a bit more present in the press. He's kind of made a couple of statements on his Tumblr. I think people assume that the fact that he gets a bit more active when it comes onto the internet and doesn't disappear, maybe was an indication that he probably was going to come. But if you know anything about Frank, you know, you know, if you know anything about his career, you'll know that number one, he's quite incons- he's inconsistently inconsistent. Um, he turns up to things that he wants to turn up to. He's essentially the R&B Wiley in that respect, right? Um, when he when he turns up, you're happy. When he doesn't turn up, you shouldn't be that upset because he didn't really, you know, he didn't give you an indication he was going to turn up. And in general, 
you know, I think this put this this should maybe be an opportunity for most fans to really come down to realize that you know Frank is just going to decide to come when he wants to come, right? Whether or not he, that means he doesn't respect his fans or he's a bit up his own ass or a bit pretentious, you know, those are things that are probably things that he'd probably agree with. But I think fans will need to come to realization that now if Frank wouldn't, if Frank didn't want to come to a Tyler Creator festival, right? Tyler Creator is somebody who has played an influential part in his career. They probably they both played, you know, they both had um probably as big of an influence on each other as you know as anything probably during the whole um odd future um come up for him to not turn up to a, to a tyler Crayer event probably says a lot about frank's ability to turn up to events so if he's not going to turn up to tyler's thing for you to expect him or for me actually for me to expect him to turn up to primavera was probably a stupid thing right i probably was um a little bit too naive in that regard and i think fans need to come to that realization too frank is just going to appear when he wants to appear and, and when he does and you catch him be be uh, be happy i think as well if you're a frank ocean fan right you could probably get away with just buying any ticket you see of frank performing because more likely than not he's not going to perform anyway so when he does perform and if you're near go and see him play just in case he does turn up but I think to you know to pin all your hopes on Frank Ocean making the festival the festival where it needs to be is ridiculous, especially with the other attendees that were, especially the other artists that were on the lineup I mentioned before. It was quite entitled and really spoiled for the you know for the fans to kind of rage out that way. But anyway, that's 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 something I've commented yesterday. So Tyler responded and kind of you know um, said a lot of the things that I've been saying regarding the whole um, episode, but also expounded on some other bits and pieces that we didn't we weren't aware of. So I'm going to quickly just go through that because why not? I've got it up here on the screen. Of course, you can find it at Tyler the Creator's um, Twitter handle. If you want to, if you want to link to, it, I'll actually add it in links to the show notes so you guys can check out yourself. But here's the, basically the full list of tweets that um, Tyler the Creator expand upon regarding the whole Drake getting booed. The first one is the following that I like to say the following: um, I thought bringing one of the greatest artists of the fucking planet to a music festival was fire. But flip side, a little tone deaf knowing the specific crowd it drew. Some created a narrative it, it in their head and acted out like assholes when it didn't come true. And I didn't fuck with that. Which is true, right? So this goes back to the idea that I'm not even sure if Frank Ocean was confirmed to appear at Camp Vlognar. I think, as per usual with these sort of events, um, most promoters, if there's chatter and talk about somebody maybe appearing at, at your party, uh, maybe a certain thing is going to happen, certain release a certain art installation some promoters don't mind the chatter continuing and don't care about dispelling or or kind of um, disproving that story or that rumor because it adds to the um it adds to the chatter the overall marketing scheme of the whole event right because if, if somebody's talking about your event whether it's in a positive or a negative it's a good thing if you're a promoter because it means that people have the event in their heads and they're speaking about it right and some people are going to be curious enough to kind of maybe pop down so that is a good thing for you but for the fans it's always horrible because what ends up happening is that fans end up kind of um fans end up conf fans end up making up their own narrative which tyler Craig has spoken about but we also end up in these little echo chambers that kind of feed into our own weird um conspiracy theories about events because we're all fans we're all going to try and confirm things and try and reassure each other that what we're thinking is true so that we don't get disappointed don't get bummed out so if we see that frank liked a picture or he was spotted at this location that was a, some so and so miles away from the venue we're going to try and rationalize in our heads why this proves the fact that he's going to come right um maybe an element of confirmation bias in there but i'm not thinking that's an actual accurate term but regardless we can kind of feed into our frenzy ourselves and you, what you'd want is for the promoter or the organizer to be like, hey guys, no, this isn't true. This isn't going to happen. Um, this person isn't appearing just to alleviate everyone's um, fear, everyone's hopes, or maybe not to, just to probably manage the expectation and just in general not to be a shithead. But I think most promoters don't do that because, you know, they want the chatter, they want the talk. Because again, like I mentioned before, it's hard enough as it is to gain, I think I mentioned before regarding the whole TI stuff and, you know, when he's talking about his daughter with the whole Hyman conversation, which was, you know, um nasty on, the, on a whole another level um but i kind of understand it in some way shape or form because as big as ti is he's probably realized how hard it is to actually penetrate culture no pun intended and to actually make a noise or move the needle it's very difficult nowadays people think it's easy but it's not that easy which is why kids are doing everything and anything under the sun to gain to become viral it's not it's not easy to do right kids are in their bedrooms try and become viral and they don't succeed um, and some of them succeed and then people in offices um with a marketing team of 20 plus people um try and make up a scheme and they don't succeed right so it's not the easiest thing to do so sometimes i can i can forgive promoters for being a bit you know 
um, a little bit loose with the truth and allowing the rumor mill to continue just so it can feed into the event. But then on the flip side, these things have unintended consequences because once you build up a frenzy, you don't dismiss the rumors because Tyler's pretty um, straight up with his fans, right? He tends to kind of like shoot from the hip. For him to like not say anything and just kind of let the rumor persist and then for it to kind of get to this point, he can kind of look in him. He has to look in the mirror a little bit and blame himself. Do you know what I mean? Like you, you played some part in it by not dismissing it outright because... I think I think Taco mentioned it earlier. Um, Jasper from Old Future mentioned it earlier. Oh, Tyler's DJ. He mentioned it earlier that you know Frank is a unicorn. For anyone to expect him to appear is ridiculous, right? He's going to appear when he when he's going to appear. You can't pin him down in that respect. He's you know these festivals that he didn't appear at when he released Blonde, right? A few what a couple of years ago when we missed him at Primavera. I'm pretty sure when you do a festival, they give you a security deposit or they give you half up front or whatever. You have to forfeit the money if you don't appear. And he cancelled loads of festivals. Fair enough, he might be, you know, ridiculously rich, but that's a lot of money to kind of like forfeit. So if, if he does that because he doesn't feel artistically inclined to go, he's not in the mood or he doesn't feel the production level is on par, that goes to show that, you know, it's going to be hard to get Frank Ocean out of bed. You know, it's going to be hard to get him out of that amazing loft apartment he's got in New York. It's not easy to get him out of there. So people are a bit, you know, naive to expect it. Anyway, continue with um, Tyler's tweets. He said the following. Um, uh, this nigga, fe- uh, this thin nigga f- uh, did no f- uh, feel. Oh, um, Drake performed Feel No Way. Sorry. That, oh, yeah, that song is really good. Again, that's another thing that really disappointed me too about the whole conversation. Oh, about the whole booing thing. If you know anything about Tyler the Creator, you know anything about him inviting big guests to his um, festival, <clears throat> you know that <clears throat> one of the best things he does, because he's such a music nerd and because he's such a um, a fan of album cuts, he tends to always get the big artists to come and perform like random songs. Like he got Kanye to perform some random album cuts so we don't get him to, to perform too often. Pharrell did the same thing. Um, he got Kid Cudi to do the same thing. And I think he's sure he's going to do the same thing with Drake. And he did the same thing with, also with J. Cole when he performed. He gets people to perform like deep album cups that a lot of fans would love for them to perform that don't necessarily go down too well in a festival environment. And you can imagine Phil No Waves. It reminds me a lot of like the the kind of like peak era Majid Jordan. It's got that sort of like da 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 that sort of like, um, I wouldn't call it Itello disco uh, feel to it. But you know, it's kind of a good vibey. Um, it's kind of like a good vibes early in the evening sort of like lounge bar tune but don't we necessarily go off in the o2 so you get why drake doesn't perform it but if you're a big fan of drake you'd love that album cut to be performed on stage so the fans deprived everyone else or some fans the hardcore fans deprived everyone else of maybe enjoying a drake set where you don't get to hear the same old stuff right you get to hear him play you get to hear him perform other shit he even performed fucking um uh wu-tang forever man and you don't ever hear him play with Time Forever. Exactly, considering how slow that song is, considering how long it is, like, ugh, so annoying, man. But it continues. Um, the song is so beautiful. Also, mostly everyone was having a great time. Those shits in the front area were the ones being rude, um, which I can see why. But now, nah, fuck that. Y'all represented me and flogged to my guests and made us look so entitled and trash, which is very true. It continues, uh, that shit was like a mob mentality and cancer culture in real life. And I think that shit is fucking trash, which is the main point here, right? I've mentioned before. I think Drake kind of played into it by asking permission, right? By saying, hey, can I continue? Do you want me to continue asking questions? You never do that. Never never address the mob, never address the crowd. If you know anything about cancer culture, outrage culture. Um, by and large, you know, some people were genuinely annoyed. I'm not going to get, I'm not going to, you know, dismiss their feelings. But for the, for the mo- my, wide majority of them, they enjoyed the fact that they were able to get someone of Drake's caliber off stage, like to boo him off stage. Oh, look, he reacted, boo him off stage, right? They enjoyed that. So I think you just don't, you don't need to play off. You don't need to play into it. I don't think so in that regard. Um, that would have been awesome. I think that's the same thing I, I kind of ascribe to, you know, the whole debate now in the Premier League with, um, or not in football in general, with racism, especially in Italy. Um, you know, they have some very backward views around like what they deem to be racist and what they deem to be taunting. I've always been of the assumption that if a player does receive racist abuse on the pitch and they feel like, you know, it's getting a bit too much and they don't want to participate in a game anymore. I don't agree with the Balotelli thing or picking the ball up and kicking into the crowd or, you know, pulling a middle finger up like the guy did um, for, I think, the Russian team recently. I would just be more, um, more um, down for just the guy deciding just to walk off the pitch silently. Don't even give them the benefit of joy to like react directly to them. Just kick the ball out of play and walk off the pitch. And if the referee asks you, just point to the crowd and say, 
they're they're making monkey noises and just go go to the tunnel and then the game might be called off whatever maybe there might be a pause and all the people booing in the crowd will be dismayed like, what the hell's going on right do you know what i mean i think that would be a better way to do it so i think in this respect with drake he probably would have been better off just just going through the hits like fuck it just being a professional just smashing it through do you know what i mean just smashing through and saying look there are some people in here that are going to enjoy it we're going to just do it for them the ones that don't enjoy it can just leave isn't it? it is what it is um frank isn't going to come i'm here now i'm going to show you a good time um, and again, like I mentioned, it's such an interesting thing because Drake is a consummate professional. He consistently turns up, like whether it's a 500 capacity um, nightclub, whether it's a basement bar, whether it's standing on the side of the stage with fucking little keyed randomly, right? He consistently turns up and has a good time with people, right? Consummate professional, um, constantly appearing, right? Constantly showing up for the big on a big stage. Whereas Frank has essentially been able to, again, I love the guy, but he's essentially been able to gain a free pass for fuckery because he dropped two classic albums, right? Nostalgia Ultra and Channel Orange. He gave us those two projects and now everything he does is, you know, is, is above reproach. Mm, I don't know about that, but maybe that is an, a, a good summation of like, you know, if you're, if, you're the, if, you're, if you're a star, if you're of Cristiano Ronaldo, which he doesn't do, right? But if you're Cristiano Ronaldo and you like to rail cocaine off of strippers' tits, right? But you still perform eight out of ten every weekend when you play for your club team people are gonna turn a blind eye to you you know railing coke off t of strippers tits really they're gonna do that they're gonna just forgive you and just you know what that's cristiano being cristiano but the moment your performance starts to dip everyone starts to point to those things being an issue but as long as you're performing the pitch no one cares so i guess in some respect frank ocean should be allowed some sort of you know get 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 um get away with anything jail free card because he dropped those classic albums that have essentially that he is he could he could be he wouldn't be arrogant to say that he maybe created a whole subgenre with that whole type of music, right? That whole R and B genre that he kind of spearheaded, which he kind of essentially jumped off the bandwagon completely off of. But he essentially birthed a whole generation of artists, so he probably can get away with not turning up to a couple of events. But come on, man, this is Tyler the Crazy event. It's meant to be his friend. He doesn't turn up. Like, come on. Anyway, continues here. Um, like I love that song, and I thought I would never, it never happen um he really did that for me and i appreciate it because he did not have to come at all see our world come together was so great in theory um da -da -da. uh but hey man shit happens all jokes aside shit low-key funny though of course it was this is someone like drake of drake's level getting booed it's just like i said like when when do you think the last time is drake got a, a bad reception at a crowd he might have gone to a place where the reception's not been as hype i'm pretty sure he could tell you that are oh, uh, was it the brazil performance i looked at? i think it was some maybe it's brazil it looked like everyone was just in awe of him. Because some places that Drake goes to, people just like are in awe. Like, oh my God, I can't believe he's here. Some places people just go completely nuts and spaz out. Like I think London treat what Drake really well because of obviously his affinity with um, the UK rap scene. I think he's gained a lot of um, goodwill here in the UK. He can probably probably do no wrong here. I'm pretty sure some places in Europe too, maybe Paris um, or maybe France in general, maybe Holland as well. I imagine Germany would love Drake as well. So there's some places where, you know, he would probably get a better response, but I, can, I can't think of any place he'd go to where he'd get booed. And plus as well, this isn't like... Um, Drake had a Tiffany Haddish moment, right? Tiffany Haddish did that, you know, the famous stage meltdown where she turned up completely fucked up on the stage and then tried to ramble through a set and people were essentially booing her and telling her she was doing a bad, you know, doing a bad job. Um, Drake doesn't is necessarily known for that. He's not necessarily known for turning up inebriated on stage and, you know, kind of phoning it in. He generally tries to put on a good show. Even when you've seen him performing clubs, right? Standing, standing on top of the DJ decks, he actually puts on a fucking good show. Um, so it's hard to see him booed for that reason. So, you know, to be, to be booed for a performance or to, because the, the fans thought the quality of music was bad is another thing. But it also goes to show just how musically inclined Tyler Crane's fan base is. And also goes to show why his albums consistently sell so well, right? Um, especially the ones that are, that are a bit, that are well received by the overall critic, you know, general fan base. Um, he, he tends to have a, a very avid music appreciated crowd people that you know like to be on like he probably you would say they were hipsters right kids that really want to be the first person to discover this new alternative guy who's a new mac demarco right those guys those kind of kids who want to discover a really cool experimental jazz band um these kids who like get annoyed if a if a video has like over twenty thousand hits they probably won't even listen to it right or views on it um so they're really inclined to music. So when they saw someone like Drake appearing, they're like, nah, God, no. I see this guy all year. He's all over my feed. I have to put up with him everywhere I go. And now this one safe haven I've got in Camp Vlog, nah, this guy is here again. It's like, ah, when will he leave us alone? Do you know what I mean? I kind of get it. Probably Beyonce would have got the same treatment. She would have turned up there too. I would assume so. Um, but here we go. 
He said, yeah, um, yeah, year eight, love. I say it's awesome, man. Eight years of camouflage, that's amazing. Again, thank you, Drake. I'm fucking pissed. Hotline Bling was next. That would be awesome. Yeah, he never performs that, innit? It's fucking crazy. Um, my fucking shit, I'm going to play that in the, in the shower right now. Okay, last tweet. Um, I was in front. <laughs> I was in the front and I hear Tyler, Tyler. I look to my left and this girl, red face, puffy, waterfall of tears, <laughs> looked into my soul and said, trembling with anger, what, what the fuck is this shit? Nigga, I turned away so quick, she was pissed, bro. <laughs> it was really awesome, man, but he's a funny guy. But yeah, um, the reception wasn't good. I think, you know, I think they can all agree that maybe it was the wrong way to present Drake in that, tw- in that concert. I think they would have been better off just announcing he was going to perform. Fuck it. And if Frank Ocean decided to turn, you know, they would, like I said before, just announce his tire crater and, and Drake, and then put in question mark whatever it was. So if if Uzi and if it just happened to be Uzi and Rocky, cool. But I don't think they needed to kind of you know completely hide all three of those acts. They could have at least mentioned one so that if the other two came out, everyone would be happy. But I think the fact that they just left it blank, the fact they didn't address it in public and say, look, he's not coming, probably just led to loads of rumors and led to people um, getting their hopes up. And then obviously when Drake pops up and it's not Frank Ocean, it's like, come on, man, like this is ridiculous. Um, maybe if you would have even booked the weekend instead of Frank, that might be my other piece. Some fans, but again, I'm probably not, I probably dis- I probably don't think so. There's probably a lot of infighting between uh, Frank Ocean fans and Weekend fans as well. So it probably wouldn't have, wouldn't have probably helped the whole matter anyway. Um, Drake responded to it too, um, courtesy of academics. Um, he basically said what I assumed he would have said. Um, he's very humble um, in the whole aspect and kind of understood it for what it is and kind of said without, you know, without saying verbatim because we don't know if Drake actually said this, but Kakimis is reporting it, said Drake is taking it in his stride though. He told me personally regarding the camp from performance, um, it's, ah, oh, my phone? I've got to decline this. Don't know who that is, who's that? Decline. Sorry about that, guys. He said the following, um, Drake is taking it in his stride, though. He told me personally regarding the camp vlog now performance, it's a moment of humility, which is always welcomed. He also added, it was just wasn't my night, wasn't who they wanted to see, which is obviously true. You know, we know, we all know this. It wasn't a big deal. I don't think it's a, 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 a slight on Drake's musical integrity or the fact that he's a peel. I just think in that, in that occasion, right, when you want to hear, when you want to hear, um, it's like when I go and DJ in certain places, right? I go and DJ like in a random bar and pub and I'm playing in front of, you know, you know, um, mums and dads and shit. They don't want to hear certain things. When you want to play in front of hipsters, they want to hear a certain kind of thing. You don't really mix the genres too much because by and large, people want to kind of, you know, some people want to get away. Some people want to hear what they hear generally day to day on their Spotify playlist, on their radio, in a club. Some people want to get to a club and hear what you kind of like or kind of bring them, show them some new stuff, right? Um, so that probably was part of the situation that happened there. Some those kids just wanted to hear something a bit different, and they'll get given the same old shit again and again and again. But you know, like I said, I think always, um, always fair in love and war. I think everyone's kind of understood it and kind of appreciated for what it is, and we can kind of you know continue on and hopefully now I think going forward too because I think he does it quite well. I think. Tyler's a good job of combining, you know, lesser known acts with like a Drake or something. You know, usually it's it's, it's not likely you'll see a Drake on the same lineup as a Gold Link, right? They probably occupy different spaces of popularity, maybe on that respect or of, of awareness for the general public. But I like the fact that Tyler does that. He mixes those two groups of people in the same place, brings different kind of fans together. Because for the most part, most of those kind of fans will like a Drake song or will like a couple of Drake projects, right? They they do. But in that arena, just with that kind of fervent expectation, you just expect something different and it didn't turn out to what it was. And, you know, it is what it is. What can you say? Um, yeah, let's move on from that one. And let's move on to some uh, pictures of the event, actually. Camp Vlog, no, I think they took some pictures. Um, as per usual, they do a good roundup of the of the event, of the people that turn up there. I think, by and large, it might be the most eclectic crowd you see at a kind of festival. I like the fact that, again, it's got a bit more of a black tint. That, again, that's not something I really kind of champion. I'm not one for identity politics, but, you know... There's not many festivals out there apart from maybe Afro Nation or something or maybe even Wireless Festival that kind of welcome that, not even that, maybe Afro Punk is the last one that kind of invites that kind of alternative. Because um, I've always been under the assumption that the general hip hop fan, especially the general hip hop, this general hip hop black fan wouldn't mind going to a couple of festivals if they were actually put on and they were actually good, right? I think the, 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 um, 
the demand for wireless tickets and the fact that that is always over that's always sold out every fucking single year goes to show that there is a real demand for that kind of music to be presented in a good way in london festival but no one's really done it well enough at the moment i've been interested to see what happens with afro nation whether or not they decide to do one in london or in the uk because i think that would work really well too we've got a lot of afro beats afro pop afro house afro swing artists here in the uk that would really um do well in that kind of a festival uh, platform and I think there's a lot of fans even you know that aren't black who like that kind of music that would love to come and get involved in that sort of thing especially the kind of dudes that throw um, all of those um, uh, those kind of dub reggae you know some Caribbean African influenced parties that happen now at the moment at the Jago you kind of combine that with a kind of commercial Afro pop Afro you know the kind of uk rap sort of like element i think that would work out really well especially with this resurgence of uk funky house um that might do really well um or funky house in general you get funky house yeah i think that, that would work out really well but i like the mix the camp vlog now has um of the people that attend i think like i said i think it's the most um culturally diverse festival without waving it like a flag or a banner tyler doesn't necessarily talk about it too often but he has a really awesome fan base in that regard right he blends you know the best of both worlds um and again um this is no um no uh, no different really um some cool installations here you've got a little slide here of the new shooter he has at the moment the giano which is quite cool there's loads of little places that you can take some really cool pictures out which i'm also very impressed with he also does a good job at that the can vlog now a little flower no sorry the golf le fleur uh, flower which looks really cool you've got the ego statue here um, which is another really cool marketing element that uh, Tyler Crater did with the whole wig and whole sunglasses and a suit. It was a very clever approach to rolling out an album, something, again, that's very going to stand the test of time, something you can take. You know, again, it's, it was a very popular Halloween outfit this year. I think it'll be popular again. Usually Halloween outfits, from my experience, especially when it's iconic images from artists, usually tend to get more popular as the years progress. So I think the next couple of years, you'll see a lot more people uh, wearing this kind of outfit, especially, you know... Um, especially fans of his music, um, it'd be a good thing to do. Because um, I think there was a long period of time where everyone started wearing the Tyler Crater um, Halloween outfit. You know, the one with the Hawaiian shirt or the vintage shirt with the cut-off jean shorts written with Biro and the pull-up socks. People started wearing that often enough, so we'll probably see a lot more of the suit. Again, big crowds, people wearing some cool outfits there as well. And just generally a good a good show, it looks like. Um, got the T-shirt the as well some merch there i didn't get merch from last year actually i was quite annoying again see everyone's wearing the fucking suit it looks so cool um again some more people wearing the tailored suit more tailored suit whereas i love that all black with the wig on and the sunglasses that looks fucking incredible um so yeah some cool outfits oh mike g's there big up mike g a long time old school old school um again some cool images man loads of, again like i said a really eclectic crowd loads of really really young fans so again i think it's cool to have somebody like like Tyler be the you know spokesperson for these kind of people. Um, Summer Walker there on stage, um, you know, because he's very much musically inclined. Um, he basically essentially you know dic he dictates the taste levels of his fan base, and they all tend to be fans of a wide variety of artists. They're all going out and buying albums and buying vinyl tapes and shit. Fucking, I didn't know um, Summer Walker was built like that. Jesus Christ, he's bodied up in it. Mama mia. She looks incredible. She's got like, these lime green cycling shorts on and the strappy top on. She looks fucking banging. Fuck me. I didn't know she was that banging. I didn't know. Okay, cool. Take it back, man. Um, Sam Walker looks incredible. Okay, so, yeah, some cool images here from the backstage. Um, Tyler Crate obviously performing, wearing his suit. He looks incredible. Oh, I love the combination of this, this outfit. This suit is like lime green brown and some browns in it that's a very cool color combination you know what it reminds me of actually do you remember back in the day on top man this is a thing man i was so fucking ahead of the curve man i fucking gutted myself i remember i wanted to get this suit from top man but i never got it it was when they were debuting i think maybe i think it might have been during the whole heyday of the whole heidi slimane at saint laurent um i think they debuted this really amazing skinny tight skinny suit um it's incredibly slim slim uh slim tie as well and it was all in fusions, so I like, had like neon pink, neon yellow, neon orange, a really shiny black. And uh, I regret not buying it, man. I remember at the time, people, someone put me off it. I don't know who. That, that's, I think, it's the, last, the first and last time anyone's ever going to put me off buying something. But I remember that suit being such a cool idea to wear just day to day. I think I went to wear it for my New Year's Eve outfit. Let me see if I can find it, actually. There's a top man 
uh, suit, uh, neon green. Let me see if I can find it. It was from like four or five years ago. It's like a long, long time ago. It's like a skinny suit. It came in like a neon green and neon yellow. I just remember thinking, this is fucking banging. But I can't remember. I, I forgot what. <sighs> yeah, they probably don't have it here anymore. But it was something. It was really from a long, long, long time ago. They did a whole collection of suits like that. They did them in like, I think, a neon yellow, an orange, a blue, or like an, a really bright electric blue. It was insanely good. Um, but I can't find it here at the moment. But similar to this sort. So you got this like blue colorway here that I'm going to pop on screen. Similar to kind of this. But a really, really skinny, a really skinny style. But I can't find it. But yeah, but that was that was uh, anyway. Last first and last time someone's ever going to tell me to wear not wear something or influence my decision. But not as baggy as this suit here at the moment, which is by ASOS. It's called a collision suit in green, which is, looks pretty cool. Man, something you might see on the runway or somewhere. These fucking boots at the moment. That Jaden boot is probably the most popular boot this year. Maybe did I see somewhere that the Jaden boot that Doctor Miles with triple sole did that win the Foot, footwear of the year category or something i saw right the award or shoe of the year it had to have won it it's honestly i think it's probably the single handedly the the one sing, single handedly might be the only dr martin's boot that's been that's come out that's got more people to wear dr martin's i don't think any other boot has got has gone that kind of reaction i don't think so um i worked at dr martin's i don't know the type of people that wore dr martin's were a particular group of people you saw it obviously the popularity of dr martin's used to increase a lot more as the season's got a little bit more colder has got more wetter people tend to come talk to mine a lot often to go buy boots you know of course um they're all leather uh waterproof sole um so slip proof sole and all that regard, regard and all that malarkey sometimes you can get ones with waterproof too especially if you put the coating on top of it but they tend to only get more popular as the you know as the months progress but this shoe i think from the, even just a general everyday person i think this might maybe rival the feeler in terms of actual popularity, man. It's so, so popular, this boot. It's insane how popular it's become, but not that surprising, really. But anyway, continue with the, with Cam Vlog now. More images here of Tyler performing, looking fucking awesome. Again, probably one of my favorite festivals to go to. I probably might try and go to it again next year. I went in 2017, had a fucking whale of a time, ended up going to the Laugh Factory, went to the Comedy Store, uh, went and saw Venice Beach for a bit too. Such a cool time. 21 Savage performing. Supposedly 21 Savage is having, having a hard time getting around um, the UK or getting around the world. He's not he's not allowed to leave the US due to his pending um, case of ice, which is a bit annoying, which is probably why we haven't heard much of him in terms of new music because he yeah, doesn't really have, you know, there's no point of dropping new music now if you can't necessarily take advantage of the reception because, you know, he, you're, not, you're not very much, you need to assume that every album you put out might contain the hit that's going to take you to the top. So in order to imagine if he does that, he drops a, a, a song that or a track that's bigger than a lot or something along those kind of lines and he's not able to tour it, that's going to be really, really disappointing. So I um, hope that goes well for him. But obviously he's doing his job and just performing, doing the best that he can. Um, and yeah, just a great eclectic group of people attending the actual festival. You've got the dude from Places and Faces there as well. Um, yeah, awesome, man. Really cool people are performing at the show. Her obviously doing a thing and performing and doing a damn thing. The baby out there too. I think Tyler Craig is a big fan of the baby and his musical videos. I think he's always kind of um, said he likes his music direction. So that might be quite cool to see if they collaborate in the future. Tyler Craig uh, um, directing a video for Ty Tyler Craig directing a video for their baby would be fucking sick. If that happens, man, that'd be so awesome. But yeah, um, cool performances regardless. I think it was, I think it debuted live on on Twitch, innit, it, right? I'm pretty sure that it was live on Twitch, so uh, you should check that out if you're that way inclined. But yeah, cool pictures nonetheless. Obviously, Drake there, Rocky as well, and Lil Uzi Vert. But yeah, um, cool performance nonetheless at Camp Frog Noir. What's is next here on the list? Supreme and Ramoa. This is interesting just because. Um, Maybe a Supreme going in a different direction. Maybe a Supreme trying to level up and trying to um, subconsciously um, influence their young fan base to get a passport and start traveling the world. Or maybe it's just another way for Supreme to milk uh, their branding and to add another point of... Um, to add another, um, what do you call it, revenue income stream for their brand overall. Because I think if you guys are familiar with Supreme, you'll know that usually, especially if you um, listen to what James Jebbia says, they usually try and partner up with people if they can't necessarily produce or manufacture the thing themselves. They'd rather go and partner up with the best in the industry and just collaborate instead of just doing it themselves. Hence why you get so many note face um, jackets at a time. Even though you're seeing Supreme ramp up the outerwear, it's no coincidence now that over the years, especially with the investment, especially with the popularity, especially with the sales, Supreme have been able to kind of ramp up the production in terms of their down jackets, which are essentially 
close enough to rivaling maybe the quality of some of the entry level um, North Face you see out there. So don't be surprised if maybe in the next few years you see Supreme completely ditch North Face and not do anything with them anymore. But that probably won't happen because North Face is so intrinsically tied to New York, tied to the graffiti scene, tied to skateboarding, tied to Supreme. So that kind of synergy in terms of collaboration might mean it might just hold, might just hang around for a while yet. But there is, it's obvious to see that there are lev they are leveling up their own in-house um, outerwear and it's maybe get to a point where they can probably do a lot more themselves in-house in than they can do with North Face, even though I'm sure North Face probably gives them the keys to the factory in terms of whatever they want because, you know, Supreme probably been maybe the single-handedly the most, you know, influential part of North Face's success over the last few years. But the Remoa collaboration is interesting because obviously Remoa is, you know, uh, industry standard in terms of l um, luggage um but they're also a very high price point right i think you can't get a remote especially some of the hard shell cases for less than maybe 300 quid or maybe more than that right so they go for a lot of money they're mostly used by people who tend to travel quite often because of the nature of the bags and of course because the nature of how they how they manufacture how they put together the fact that you know they're essentially indestructible can get chucked from high heights and thrown all over the place and they tend to kind of keep their shape and um, they're fairly robust they have a very good warranty scheme and they're generally just quite expensive right so if 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 that is the case you definitely you tend to going to be somebody who's going to use it a lot more often or if you can afford to have it as a piece of um furniture in your house you're probably going to be able to have the necessary income to allow you to you know to throw 400 or 300 quid down the drain but I'm interested to see how this kind of marries up to with Supreme's current clientele, which is, you know, probably kids between the ages of, what, 13 to 25, maybe, um, who are generally not making that much money. If they are making a lot of money, it's probably, you know, due to the odd flip here and there. Not odd, but, you know, mostly flips of, of trainers that they're reselling or maybe some other um, nefarious uh, things they're doing on the side. But for the most part, I wouldn't necessarily uh, think of the Supreme customer nowadays are being quite well traveled if anything the most people i've seen carrying his bag which is maybe ironic or maybe a little bit um um disappointing to the people at supreme the people that I've seen really using it often are the people that tend to get supreme for cheap or tend to get it supreme for free they're quote unquote friends and family um the, the influencers that kind of you know um, wear the stuff or get given preferential treatment to kind of come in and buy ahead of time they're the people that are using it more often and they tend to be the people that get flown around places for free or they get to attend to events here and there or get flown out for fashion weeks and to do, you know, to go to, you know, um, Art Basel, Miami and shit, Miami Art Basel. Those are the people that I generally tend to do it. So I'm not sure if I've, if you, if you've seen an uptake in like random sporty kids who wear box logos turning up at Gatwick Airport or at Heathrow or Stansted. I don't necessarily see that. And I travel quite often, um, at least probably four or five times a year, especially when I'm going to my little European trips. And I don't see anyone maybe except with the exception of maybe a couple of asian people here and there carrying the supreme luggage actually using it as a luggage thing i don't see anybody at, at all maybe in the, in the states it's different because people can travel domestic quite often but i'm interested to see how it kind of rolls out and who it's going to appeal to or maybe it's just again maybe just another way to kind of expand the supreme brand overall but it's a very odd collaboration i think in that respect um i know now east pack are doing um luggage i saw it on sense recently east pack did some luggage but this Supreme film, I'm not really sure about. Um, but anyway, this is, this is the second one or the third one. Is the second one? The first one was the one with all the Supreme written in big bold letters, whatever, right? In the black and red. This might be the second one. So the second collaboration, I think, was Supreme. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Yeah, this is the second one from the last year's 2018 one. So this is a really cool lookbook. I think it looks like maybe someone from the Paris store um, in the lookbook, which looks pretty interesting with their dog and the supreme luggage here on the on some steps it's covered in this spider pattern which looks really cool i think looking wise maybe what do you call it spider web or do you call it smash glass i say spider web right it's definitely spider web pattern all over the top of it which again looks really cool you've got the supreme look box logo here at the bottom there which looks really amazing as well i'm a big fan of it um have they spoken about what the inspiration was behind the black web let's see if i can find it actually Let's just take this off the screen because I would like to know what who done that. Was there an artist that collaborated with them on it or just something they just did randomly? Because I'm quite a big fan of that. Let's see what Supreme News says about it themselves and not read what the regurgitated type piece put out sometimes. So this is from Supreme website. Supreme Remoa. This for Supreme has worked with Remoa on a custom version of the aluminium check in L suitcase and carry on size plus suitcase made exclusively for supreme the suitcase features silver aluminium bodies with black anodized pattern and logo custom logo jacket viscose lining multi-wheel system wheels tsa combination locks 
two internal flex driver systems and a co-branded leather luggage tag awesome available in, in supreme stores da, da, da. so there's no no indication of who actually designed um the the suitcase or who actually applied that illustration but i'm a big fan of it i think it looks pretty cool you've got two two sides you've got maybe the check-in luggage size and the cabin luggage size which you know probably the most popular ones out of them again all aluminium in black as well looks very cool very interesting i'm a big fan of this of the black over the al silver aluminium anyway and of course on the inside you've got supreme written all over it and loads of supreme custom tags on it which i think um wasn't it i think the person gearing this up i think because remote is lbmh isn't it owned i'm pretty sure that alexandra the kid the son of bernard arno is the one that's heading up the remote um you know creative collaborations thing that they're doing at the moment so this might mean that we're going to see a lot more other, a lot other, a lot more other brands do. Like, well, we are, we have, we have it, right? We saw Off White do it too, so we probably might see them really ramp up the production with other brands in terms of making co-branded pieces of luggage. But again, I just don't know. The the brands have to be very specific about who does it because I don't know whether or not the fans can even afford this sort of thing, whether they, they need it. Um, most of those kids will just be wearing, you know, just be using just some random luggage they bought at TJ Maxx and shit. They probably won't be, you know, wanting to spend 300 or 400 pound plus on some Supreme Remoa luggages, which again is a mistake because this will probably last them longer than anything else would because, you know, if you're a kid, maybe those kids, you have to give them more benefit of doubt because they might be, because if I was a kid, I'd probably be 10, I'd probably be more... I'd probably be more inclined to buy a backpack from Carhartt and Supreme rather than to buy a backpack from, you know, some random sports brand, right? You'd want to get it from the brand that actually makes high quality backpacks because it's going to last you a long time. It's going to be something that's going to earn you cool points in school, you know, and if you've run into some um, into some bad times, you can always flip it and sell it and, sell it and get, some, get a bit of money out of it. You can't exactly resell an Umbra bag you got from Argos, can you? So that might be part of it. And I know I didn't do that. When I was younger, I tend to buy loads of shitty backpacks. And then when I got into the scene, I started to get a bit more understanding of quality. Then you start kind of getting into buying those sort of things. And you start to, you know, fantasize about buying a Visvin bag and shit. And then you realize how much it is. And you say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm just going to sell for the car. <laughs> but yeah, I, I like it, man. I, I like the suitcase. Again, I'm interested to see how this kind of is uh, um, received by the overall fan base. I think it's more interesting this one because the other one was obviously just essentially just another piece of furniture someone's going to leave in their house you know supreme written all over the fucking suitcase it's something that's a bit bait but this is a lot more low-key a lot more in the direction of people that actually want to use it for an actual travel accessory and again interesting to see how, how and interesting to see whether or not it actually will inf influence kids to actually start traveling and going places which would be cool to see really um just you know even if it's just like kids start traveling um the world or traveling europe just to do what i do in terms of clubs but do it in terms of streetwear shops or in terms of scenes or in terms of record stores that would be awesome right um, even department stores imagine a kid decides to travel all the way to the states to go and visit a nordstrom or to go to visit you know dover street market or to go to see the golf wine store or to go see the original supreme store do you know what i mean that would be pretty cool if that was actual thing which i'm not sure it is but you know that would be cool that there is hope there but anyway check it out if you're that way inclined it's going to be out when i think this thursday right yeah, so it's available on Supreme Source Online so September, November 14th. Sorry, Japan is available to 16th and it's available in all remote stores on the 16th too, which is interesting rollout for that. I think that might be the only co-branded or collaborated stuff that Supreme has done that's available in the actual store itself. North Face collaborations aren't available in the store. They're only available in Supreme. Vans, the same thing. Nike, the same thing. Um, yeah, it might be the only collaboration they do that's available in the actual store they collaborate with. So there must be a lot of money in it. And also, it's probably an indication that, you know, most of the people buying that suitcase will be Remoa fans as opposed to Supreme fans. So, you know, there is maybe some um, synergy there in that respect. But yeah, check it out if you're that way inclined. Supreme Remoa collection number two, I would say, um, after, the sec after the first one that was really popular. Anyway, moving on. We have here, oh, I wanted to talk about the foam runner again, right? The Kanye foam runner. Um, just because, you know, the first video was mostly um, about what he was, you know, talking about when he was doing his little interview with uh, the Fast Company alongside Stephen Smith, who barely got any words in, which, you know, he feels sorry for him. But, you know, there's that standard Kanye. His, his interviews are usually an opportunity for him to kind of rant and rave about stuff. But I was just thinking about the shoe in general and about the impact it could have on the footwear industry. And about how people will actually receive it just because i was kind of mulling it over and thinking about where the inspiration of it come from and i think what i heard first of all oh god almighty i don't know who this person is who is that i don't know who that is i need to where's my phone actually I need to turn this off this is annoying me at the moment new launch actually oh god almighty okay let me let me just put on airplane mode for now 
Yeah, so anyway, um, I was thinking about it today about the whole um, Kanye foam runner thing. I've got it up here on the screen actually from the Yeezy Mafia. This is actually Kanye wearing the shoe at um, Travis Scott's um, Astro World performance. Um, I think he brought Kanye out as a special guest and he performed Follow God and a few other tracks or a few other snippets. I think he's only there for about 15, 10 minutes or whatever performing. But he's actually wearing the shoe and they actually look a lot better on as I assume they would look than they looked in hand when he was holding it. I took him with Steven Smith on the stage. If anything, they just remind me of a um, UG700 I already have, but just essentially imagine you got a UG700 and you were somehow able to gut it on the inside and then pour EVA, um, molten EVA inside of it, let it cool off and somehow pop, plop it out. That's what it reminds me of. It reminds me of the, ins, like it reminds me of the in, inner sock of a boot or something. Um, I remember Stephen Smith during an interview saying something along the lines of uh, Kanye is now pushing the design team in the direction of having shoes with no laces. I think the reason it came behind him performing at the Sunday service and being able to slip in and out of shoes and having to tie things gets annoying. So now he's under the guise where he doesn't want any um, any laces on his shoes, which is you know which makes sense because the these seven hundreds I have at the moment because of the way they're shaped. Because of the sizing can be a bit difficult to get right to because I think from the Wave Runner that I have to the 700s that I have in the mauve colorway, um, the sizing completely is different. You know, they're completely different sizing, completely different tooling, I reckon. Even even the shape is quite, um, it's not similar at all. Um, but then they improved it quite drastically in the mauve because they have elastics on the side of the tongue, right? So... The tongue doesn't move around as it did on a wave runner. It moved around quite often. You kind of had it, you know, going to the edge. It kind of just got a bit annoying. It might even get to a point where I might actually stick a little bit of elastic on either side of it myself just to kind of make sure it sits really well on it. But anyway, the, the, the wave runner, they kind of got wrong in that respect on the tongue and they kind of improved it with the subsequent models. Um, but I'm just looking at it overall. I'm just thinking to myself, like, it might be a big game changer in terms of how shoes or how things are approached, especially when you think about the increase of, you know, um, trendy pattern socks that kids wear nowadays, the ones that they kind of have with clear dunks and clear shoes. Um, the fact that for the most part, people tend to wear, nowadays especially, people tend to wear really Larry trainers with really muted um, tops. I think about your general Essex lad, who might wear a pair of skinny jeans, some, you know, some really basic long seat top from Vivian Westwood with a little crest logo on the, on the you know, left bro breast pocket so you know what's up. And then some really Larry trainers, like a pair of Yeezys, right? I think with that kind of outfit, I think we might see a change in the outfits where people now tend to kind of flip it and wear really loud outfits or really loud clothing and then have muted colorways down below. Like imagine this wave runner or this foam runner in a black or in an off gray, in an off white, in like a muted um, pastel colors or something like a Tiffany blue. Um, like a washed out red, like a washed out orange. They would work really well with some kind of louder outfits, louder pattern trousers and stuff. And also maybe going forward, especially because the rumor is that these are going to be $70, right? These uh, these are foam runners. So they might be the first wave run. They might be the first Yeezy that he kind of makes. Because I remember him mentioning in interviews that he wanted a Yeezy that was able to, he wanted a shoe, he wanted to manufacture a shoe that was being able to sell, that could sell under $100. And obviously everyone could buy you could buy, you know, at Zoomies or wherever it may be. This might be the first Yeezy that he's able to kind of mass produce to that kind of level, be available in all kinds of different retailers, not only available at the tier zero places. And also it might also open him up to a whole different um, segment of the market because this is a shoe that I could easily get my mum to wear, right? Because um, there are quite, you see quite often here and there, you do see some pictures on teamkanyedaily.com um, or Team Kanye West Daily or whatever that uh, handle is on Twitter. They do sometimes retweet images of older folk wearing some of Yeezys and shit and it makes people laugh for it. It's, oh my God, they're hype, you know, um, these old people are wearing hype trainers. But it does make sense if you're an older person to be maybe to kind of um, uh, lean more towards the boost um, sole um, area of shoes as opposed to anything else. They're quite comfortable. They're essentially quite easy to wear. Um, they're, you know, usually, at that, especially if it's a 350 or 350 V2s, a sock, essentially. Um, the sizing is quite easy to get done. And for the most part, if you're an older person, you don't necessarily care about your shoes matching your outfits and shit. You just want something comfortable that you can walk around in all day. Um, so that might be a cool option. And then you think about it further and you think about the um, medical professionals who wear um, clogs and stuff, right? That's what they were. Is it Crocs? No, I think it's Crocs they wear, right? Um medical shoes let's see if i can find it. i think it's i think it's crocs i'm pretty sure it's crocs and what nurses and shit wear 
Okay, so Birkenstocks make a make a version of it too. I didn't know that. Okay, Birkenstocks make a version of their shoes as well, but usually, most most likely it's usually Crocs that they wear, isn't it? Um, so this is the sort of shoe that you see a medical professional wearing, like you know, a nurse or whatever it may be, um, because by and large they're easy or someone working within a kitchen because you know you can slip your foot in and out of them. Like they they're usually quite comfortable. Um, you know, just an easy shoe to get in and out of, fairly inexpensive. You don't mind spilling, you know, someone's blood on it or some <laughs> some boiling hot olive oil and shit. So imagine this area of of customer wanting something a little bit more. But then maybe not because of the holes in it. It might be a bit of a health hazard that, that way with the holes in the front. But I don't know. Maybe maybe that might not be a good idea. But maybe just in general, in terms of just an everyday shoe that you can take with you to work, or I imagine just the kind of the everyday um, commuter, especially the people that I see going to work around Liverpool Street, um, especially the the females out there who tend to not want to wear their heels all the way from their home all the way to work. I could see them maybe wearing a foam run like this. And then having your heels in your in your in your in your bag, and these shoes being a little more chic to wear than actually wearing your fucking you know those shitty running shoes that they wear, um, they look pretty cool. I like them. I think the fact that the sole is quite thick as well is a good improvement. It looks like um, Kanye's heel comes up quite high on these, so they've actually got an actual sole at the bottom. So it's not just you're not just you know on the you're not just you don't have your foot completely on the floor like a complete pimp sole, which it helps in that regard. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of them. I think they're going to be fairly popular. I, I think they're going to open up Kanye to a whole different world. And I also think if he's able to be a billionaire on the, off the back of 350s and that and God, I think these shoes will actually take it to the next level. I'm pretty sure of it, especially if they're going to be under a hundred dollars. I've heard they're going to be seventy five dollars, eighty dollars. So if that's the if that's the price range, like expect these to be absolutely everywhere. Um, and yeah, I think they're going to be fairly popular. Um, I think you're going to see quite a lot of people on YouTube reviewing them as well and making them work with different sort of outfits. So it's, again, I'm interested to see what happens with them going forward. Um, again, I'm a big fan of the Yeezy, especially the Yeezy 700. I think these kind of lane, this kind of lend a lot of the inspiration from it. So I'm interested to see what they look like in hand when they're um, going to be available, hopefully recently, hopefully very soon. Um, no indication of it so far, but with Kanye being on stage and him wearing them now and talking about them with steven smith it points the direction that you know this isn't there's no smoke about fire so we're probably going to see these probably sooner rather than later maybe first quarter of next year but yeah keep your eyes peeled for that yeezy foam runner next on the list what do we have here da, 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 da. oh another yeezy news too you got the yeezy boost 380 are you a big fan of these i quite like these actually i'm, I'm not i'm not that against them I, when i saw them at first i wasn't that keen on them but I quite like the shape. I quite like the look of them. Essentially, they look like a 350 that I could wear. I think the Easy Boost 350 at the time they came out, and even now, because um, I know some people that have them, um, they're quite pointy. And I think for somebody like myself that has quite wide feet, um, they don't necessarily lend well to a person with wide, long feet. You tend to kind of have, need to have a good, you know, I think Easy 50 might look only good up until maybe a size UK 10. And then again, you have to make sure that you're quite tall and shit and got, have quite skinny legs so they don't look too clunky. But I quite like the look of the 380s. They probably combine the best of the of the 350 and maybe the 700s. Um, you've essentially got this weird sort of like, um, how do you call it? It's essentially like the, the back of the shoe is really raised quite high, which might remind me a little bit of the nike runners are out at the moment and then the and then it kind of thins out towards the front so you've got a little bit more of a thinner um outsole towards the front of the shoe um and again an interesting pattern on top of it kind of a camo inspired pattern and then you've got the quintessential or the ink iconic sort of like easy 350 stripe alongside the side of it again no real branding on the outside quite in quite in this quite in this quite under discreet or whatever that word is called um overall on the upper no real branding in terms of adidas you can see on it but yeah it looked pretty cool so this is this article from sneaker freak it says the drop deals of adidas easy boost 350 alien it is set to be a huge finish to 2019 for the easy brand um a loaded release calendar headlined by the brand new easy 700 v3 and the 380 aliens okay well, what's the release calendar i didn't see this actually it's something i saw previously what else is coming out i think it might be that 700 that i previewed in another video before didn't i right Okay, so this is the calendar for the free. Oh, wow, really? In December? That is amazing. I'm looking forward to that. So the Yeezy December schedule looks as follows. We have the Yeezy 350 V2 in the Yeezy Real. So you've got it's like a neon color. I'm not really a fan of that one. Um, then you've got the Yeezy 500 High, which looks really cool. Probably a, a, be a, better, a better representation of that model in the high than anything else. Then you've got the Yeezy 350 V2 in the other colorway then you've got more 350 v2s and then you've got this colorway the the 700 v3 in the azal that looks amazing it reminds you of like a, a, a car model shit like a car like maybe like you know those what was that audi shoe that kobe wore back in the day do you remember that 
Reebok Audi shoe that they did back in the day. It reminds you, and again, I won't be surprised whoever designed that Yeezy 700 V3 was some sort of former car designer or something of those, of those like. It looks very, very similar to that. And you've got the Yeezy 700 in a carbon blue coming out as well. So it looks like they're, they're keeping the Yeezy 700 shit because I thought they were going to phase it out and then just keep giving you the four, the Yeezy V2 and V3, which is interesting because you can't get the Yeezy 350 OGs anymore, right? They basically phase those out. So you get different iterations of the Yeezy, but with the 700, they've kind of kept the original shape, but then still keep giving you the V2 and V3. Interesting to see why they've decided to do that. Maybe because it's just popular overall. But anyway, back to the 380 um, Alien. The silhouette is beamed straight from outer space. Kanye West, a latest, was originally dubbed the 350 V3 before getting a last minute name change. Okay, cool. So it was meant to be a lineage of the 350, but now it's, it's, a, it's basically a progression or an evolution of, the, of that 350 shape, which makes more sense. Um, composed of a new prime knit pattern on the upper. Okay, awesome. And a hefty boost midsole. Yeah, it's definitely a hefty boost midsole. I like the fact that most of these shoes are very comfortable to wear. Maybe it goes back to where he's at the moment, Kanye, in terms of, you know, he likes hiking. He likes to take long walks to kind of clear his head and shit. So maybe that's probably part of the reason why these shoes are essentially very comfortable. Or maybe the fact that he's got Stephen Smith with him, who's, you know, was the head hunter at New Balance. And they're, you know, known for having probably the best walking shoe out at the moment. But I like the fact that you can necessarily walk around with them wherever you know as long as you want in a pair of uses and you don't really get um fucked up feet all that lot of stuff so it says you had easy boost seven um easy boost sorry 380 alien is slated to hit the planet earth on november 16th for 230 dollars doesn't really say that on the list of, of options here though you don't really have it on there so i'm not sure where they got that information from maybe i'm incorrect but yeah okay they're saying it's going to come out on when's that november 16th so maybe in a couple of days really so keep an eye out for that i haven't seen anything online that indicates that on my on my end but you know maybe i'm not that well versed in it so if you guys are more aware than i am then please let me know but yeah interesting to see how that what happens with those um i'm interested to see what more colors you get out of them of course if they bring out black and white color you know your boy is completely on them like sonic but yeah they look really cool i'm a, I'm a big i like these if i was gonna wear a shoe like the 350 i think i prefer to wear the 380 i think that probably suits my uh foot and my style a bit more than maybe the 350 looks overall. And I just like the fact that they kind of, you know, they look like they point downwards. They kind of have that amazing, aggressive silhouette on them. So, yeah, a really big up Kanye with the tooling as well on the on the Yeezys, man. They all look so flat at the front of the forefoot. I love that. None of that kind of annoying Nike banana foot thing they had on their old retros back in the day. So that I'm very much impressed with. So, yeah, check those out if you're that way inclined. Yeezy Boost 380 Alien coming to you very, very soon. What else do we have here? Uh... What else we have? What else we have? What else we have? I think that might be it, isn't it, really? Just leave it there, actually. Uh, yeah, leave it there. Then we'll come back because we've got an hour. We're already an hour in. So, yeah. As always, thanks so much for tuning into the show. It's the Excellent Zing Show, episode number 248. As per usual, if you're watching via the YouTube app, please give me a thumbs up and a like and a comment. Let me know what you think of the show. If you liked what I had to say, why not subscribe and put on the notifications so that you can be aware of my other shows that come out or other clips I have on my channel. If you're listening via the podcast app, leave me a five-star review so people can find the show. That'd be pretty cool. And if you want to learn more about myself, what I do, and the things that I get up to, please check out my, web, my site, excellentzinger.com. You'll find my links to myself, email. Um, you'll find contact sheets there. You'll find um, fly designs I've done, photography stuff i've done my blog post you'll find my dj mixes all the stuff that contains that pertains to moi on my website xnozinger.com check that out if you're that way inclined uh, until then until we see each other again very very soon take care of yourself and we'll speak to each other soon take care bye 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 bye